Shukran so much for joining us in studio. No, thanks. It's great to be here. I'm excited to be here with you guys. And, and I was just saying to you early on off air that I'm not going to read your whole bio. I'm not going to read all the books that you authored. That will simply take up too much time. <laughs> because this this term, Islamophobia, that's mm-hmm. bandied about, that we see so often uh, within the media, that all of us talk about. So uh, I'm looking at the dictionary explanation mm-hmm. where it says that it's a fear of and hostility towards Muslims and Islam. It's driven by racism. It often leads mm-hmm. to exclusionary, discriminatory and violent actions targeting Muslims and those perceived as Muslim. Your comments on this definition and in light of where the world finds itself. Mm. Um, yeah, well, you know, well, first of all, um, I'd like to say that the reason I began to work on Islamophobia and rethink and reframe what it means is I was highly dissatisfied with the dictionary definition, right? I thought the dictionary definitions and the prevailing definitions didn't do a good job Uh, addressing what the state was doing, how governments and policies and laws were very much the the primary catalysts in perpetuating Islamophobia. So it's more than just fear. Uh, It's more than just irrational bigotry. Uh, In many respects, it's a very um, well put together plan and designed by governments to vilify Muslims to carry forward specific economic and political objectives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in light of, I mean, if one thinks about where the world finds itself and, and in light of the fact that we know a lot of this, these types of terminology came mm. to the fore after after September 11th, um, how did that play into when, when you were writing the book mm. and your understanding around how it manifests in the world? Yeah, well, you know, Islamophobia, broadly speaking, as a sort of system of knowledge or misknowledge, predates 9-11. But the the post 9-11 moment really saw the weaponization of anti-Muslim attitudes, policy and bigotry really come to the fore and really become um, sort of focal in the way that the American war on terror was deploying anti-Muslim attitudes and stereotypes to justify wars in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, to justify profiling programs, to justify laws that uh, enabled the surveillance and policing of Muslim communities, uh, globally speaking. So one thing I write about in the book and all my writing is to, to, to make it clear that we have to connect the way we think about Islamophobia today to how we thought about Orientalism, the system of this master discourse of how um, the West sort of saw itself as the mirror opposite of the East and specifically the Muslim world. So in many respects, Islamophobia is the progeny of Orientalism and Orientalism was theorized by a very prominent Palestinian scholar and intellectual Edward Said. So that lineage is really key. Even though Islamophobia becomes a, a term of popular cognizance after 9-11, uh, the system of stereotypes and tropes against Muslims uh, very much existed in the underbelly of the, the American, the global imagination well before 9-11. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, and, and I'm just I'm just wondering uh, then then within within your experience and I mean you 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 travel a lot uh, you you are a scholar as well you're a law professor as well mm. um, and and then in terms of how how it plays out amongst um, for lack of a better term you know ordinary people people like ourselves yeah. who also want to navigate our daily lives and mm. believe that we are living in these democracies and believe we are living in spaces yeah. where, where 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 there's free speech and and, and liberation etc what would your observations be around that yeah well you know i'm an ordinary person too i write from the perspective of a prototypical muslim living in the west mm. And that's, a, 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 you know, the primary reason why I decided to become a scholar and a writer on these issues is uh, I grew up in Detroit, which is a very, very large Arab and Muslim population. Um, in the 9-11 moment, my community, you know, my family members, my friends were being targeted and policed. Myself was being policed by many of these policies that came, you know, came into being um, in the post 9-11 context. So I I think one thing that really motivates my writing and my research is to, even as an academic, academics oftentimes only write for other academics. Mm -hmm. I was always very keen on writing for um, general audiences and community members. And I wanted to make sure that my writing was understandable by people like, you know, my brother who didn't, my brother didn't go on to college or my mother who was an immigrant or my neighbor or the owner of uh, the restaurant or the you know the halal butchery down the street uh, because these are the individuals being affected by the policies. 
So for me, in the way in which I approach my public writing, it's very important to make it understandable and accessible uh, to anyone, regardless of who they are. Yeah, and that that's incredibly important. Yes, exactly. This idea of of academics not just existing in ivory towers, and so your your observations, of course, also interweaving with 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 your own humanity, if one can call it that. Mm. You know, like you say, your own lived experience. Um, but I suppose why I ask it in that way is exactly that that, that your observations in terms of also how you've traveled as yep. a scholar, yes, as as a person, but also, of course, as a scholar. And so how this plays out, because uh, I, I suppose also a lot of this concern is around the fact that we are often, um, as 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 ordinary citizens, we, we tend to think that we live mm. in these spaces where, yeah. where it's all about freedom and, and, and democracy. So so even in the in the way in which you've traversed the world, the way in which you've traveled, do you see, um, uh, let's say, the things that we miss about Islamophobia, do you see it manifest differently? Oh, definitely. Across uh, countries and contexts, Islamophobia is a different animal, right? And that's what really motivated me to write this third book, The, the New Crusades. Yeah, yeah. So um, in the in the process of touring the first book, I had the chance to really travel, you know, many places across the world. You know, I went to Rajasthan in India, I went across Europe, um, I, went to, um, I went to South America, you know, across... Um, Middle Eastern and Arab countries. And one thing I noted was that Islamophobia was being, in the war on terror more broadly, was being inflicted and experienced dramatically differently um, from country to country. Uh, and in the process of meeting people from, you know, places like Syria and Myanmar and East Turkestan, Uyghur Muslim, uh, Chinese folk, and meeting ple- people from Kashmir and India, um, you know, what I was realizing was that there were a number of really important distinctions that made the experience of Islamophobia um, very um, unique and diverse, depending on where the individual came from. And during the course of these interviews, that's what really sparked my desire to want to write this third book, to you know, to make it plain and to make it um, clear that Islamophobia was a global sort of leviathan that was um, shaping experiences differently um, for Muslims around the world. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, subhanAllah, it was a, a eye-opening experience. Um, and even though I'm, I'm an academic and I study this stuff from a, you know, a legal standpoint, it was really speaking to real people um, that made this third book, I believe, um, gave it a texture that I think is, is missing from the first book in many ways. Yeah, and, and for that reason, we speak about these tentacles because the, 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 the far-reaching impacts and effects um, in, in, in sort of very insidious ways mm-hmm. uh, that it plays out. And, uh, and, and one realizes that a large part of this, say, this deception lies exactly within the fact that it's so insidious mm-hmm. and that it plays out in spaces which are, um, which are often proclaimed to be, you know, as I yep. said earlier, democracies and, and, and spaces of freedom and mm-hmm. free speech, et, et, et cetera. Um, um, and, and so perhaps also just your, 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 your comments on that as well. Yeah, well, look, I think in, I listened really closely to the, uh, the preface you gave to the interview and the fact that we're 250 days into this genocide in Gaza. And I think that in, this, this genocide has really crystallized many things. But for us living in the West or whatever the so-called West is, one thing that it's really exposed is this this myth of Western democracy and the rule of law, right? The idea that the Western countries like, you know, European countries, my country, the United States, uh, you know, very, you know, try to project and market themselves as bastions of democracy and bastions of dignity and bastions of civil rights. Um, but as a professor of law, one thing I've known, always known, is that democracy is selectively uh, a sign. You know, a sign, and democracy and civil rights and humanity are, you know, hypocritically extended to some individuals based on a range of things. Race is one of them. Religion is another one of them, uh, and also interests. Right? How does a specific issue align with Western interests? So, w- to your question that you asked before. Um, just because we live in so-called democratic countries does not mean number one they're imperfect democracies right i I might even question to say that the united states for instance um, is democratic in ways that only sort of are contingent to its economic and political interests um, and is not willing to extend those rights to individuals that it views to be inferior or lesser um 
so when I when this genocide was beginning, the first thing that I thought about was uh, juxtaposed with what was happening in the Ukraine, right? In the way in which media and policy in the West was really leveraging its power and authority, its sort of you know collective uh, power and authority to sort of raise up the Ukrainian struggle as a struggle for self determination, sovereignty. Uh, democracy, all those wonderful things that the West allegedly believes in. But when Palestinians were attempting to do the same thing, right, they were instantly vilified. They were instantly dehumanized. They were in, in, they were instantly categorically called terrorists, even though they were doing the same thing and fighting for the same thing, things that Ukrainians uh, are fighting for. So that just demonstrates how um, Western governments, specifically my government, are contradictory, hypocritical, and still staunchly Islamophobic in the way they think about and formulate um, policies. And I think it's so interesting uh, um, when you when you brought up Edward Said early on, Orientalism, uh, just a couple of days ago, I think, um, on our news reviews and analysis program where they usually have an extended interview between eight and nine, there was uh, a discussion around language, and mm. poetry, and, uh, and literature, and the impact it has and so I thought it was so interesting, even when you mentioned Orientalism, and uh, uh, one doesn't always realize. I think we we and this is part of of the dominant narrative of the liberal narrative that yeah. one gets so caught up in the me myself and I that you don't realize the insidious ways in which one is constantly bombarded with ideas around how certain people or certain groups of people are positioned to be, and those are the inferior ones, and those are the superior mm -hmm. ones, etc. Mm -hmm. And then even just through language use. And so I thought it was interesting that you that you brought this up that uh, if one looks now to the to the genocide um, and, and that's been happening for decades and we just see it in so much more prominence uh, now and how Palestinian people yes have been framed mm. uh, in a particular way but how Arabs have been framed in, in a particular way through yes in these apparently democratic countries etc mm. through the use of language through the use of, let's say, other instruments that all contribute to Islamophobia, all in all, um, and and so so in view of of the genocide, yes, in the in the and the horrific way in which it's playing out now, mm. um, the absolute impunity with which uh, uh, people are being slaughtered and massacred. Mm. Um, one realizes that yes, there was a long history. There's a long history to this. It was, yep. uh, let's say, it it. All of this, this the Islamophobia, etc. It it was it's very strategic and it very strategically plays into the minds of 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 the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and so perhaps if you can just also speak to that and yeah. and 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 explain from your perspective as a scholar also and somebody from those spaces how it um, how you see this unfolding in the way that it has yeah. now. I'm I'm really glad you brought up the the theme in the power of language, right? Because when you were speaking, it reminded me of a quote from um, Brazilian educational scholar Paulo Freire, right? And he says, "Language is never neutral, and it's up to a subaltern, subordinate community uh, to effectively reclaim language and uh, reconstruct narratives in ways that reflect their lived experiences." And Edward Said even said uh, in the preface of his book, "Out of Place." I am an Oriental writing back at the Orientalists who for so long have thrived upon our silence. Right. And that was when I read that as a child or a teenager, it was it was kind of like a command to action to me, because whenever it is we watch, um, you know, Western media outlets and digital outlets today, it's predominantly white people and white men talking about Islam, talking about Muslims, talking about the Arab world, talking about issues that are germane to what's happening in places like Palestine, Lebanon, Yemen. Uh, in the region at large. So the, the, the power of language and reclaiming language is really central to dismantling Islamophobia because we have to, as Muslims, uh, and that's why it is that I wrote these books and why mm -hmm. I wanted to dedicate myself to a life of research and uh, to reclaim our stories from our perspective. So when you talk about lived experience, yeah, I mean, for me, um, uh, this genocide is deeply personal because it reminds me of my childhood. I spent three years of my childhood as a child in Beirut during the war in Lebanon, which was initially a civil war, which then eventually spilled into a regional war when the PLO, the PLA, PLO moved into Beirut and made it their capital. And then Israel started bombing Beirut, uh, where I lived as a child as a consequence of the PLO being there. So 
when I when I picked up the phone in the beginning of this genocide and I was seeing images, you know, all these images that we know very well right now, you know, landscapes of destroyed squares and quarters, entirely gray and people living atop rubble, that th these are really familiar images to yeah. me because these were images of my childhood, right? They looked like war-torn Beirut. Gaza right now looks like war-torn Beirut. It's the place that I grew up in. When people talked about sirens, you know, signaling that Israeli jets were coming in, that was my childhood. When people talked about you know, having to live in a bomb shelter for a week or two weeks. That was my childhood. I still remember vividly, uh, February 20th, 1987, we celebrated my sister's birthday in a bomb shelter. So when this genocide began, it took me back to my childhood and all these images that I had of, you know, um, children who were with, with amputated limbs and men, you know, having missing legs and losing loved ones and buildings being bombed. Um, this story that we see in Gaza right now, and like you mentioned earlier, is by no means a novel and new story. It's just a, you know, kind of a contemporary passage of a long-term history that has really plagued not only the people of Palestine, but the people of Lebanon, the people of Syria, um, and so forth and so on. My father lost his businesses to Israeli war jets. You know, my father had a record store. It was bombed by Israel in 1987. He was never the same after that. We left Lebanon as a consequence of that war. So... And we see that war now in Gaza spilling into places like South Lebanon. Um, I've had f friends of mine that were assassinated during this genocide. So um, it is part and parcel of a broader imperial sort of quest that Israel is launching in conjunction with the United States to expand what is called what they call greater Israel into places like Gaza, the West Bank. And we can talk about ethnic cleansing being ongoing in the West Bank. Uh, during the course of these last 250 days, but also the objective to take over places like South Lebanon, which Israel occupied until 2000. I can talk for a long time, but I'm going to shut up there because I'm sure <laughs> no, there's please, a lot for us to talk about. Uh, please, please do carry on because I, I think it's so important for us again to realize uh, the ways in which these, when we speak about tentacles, it's not just a word that we use. Mm -hmm. It really is about how far reaching it is. And uh, and again, if one thinks about particularly what is happening in Palestine now, how this has been coming coming along for decades, for centuries, if yeah. one wants to go as far. It's maybe just a, 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 a long time ago we didn't have all these terms and con mm -hmm. concepts. But it's so important for us to understand the depths. Yep of these concepts when we when we when we speak about it and 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 yes again when we turn to us uh, to scholars like like edward said and when we see how particular peoples have been framed and positions mm -hmm. positioned as being the other and 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 how these differences are constantly emphasized not just different from us white superiority mm -hmm. not just different from us but also lesser than us mm -hmm. this lives having less value and thus we can uh, bandy about these numbers you know 10,000 20,000 15,000 yeah. people but the impacts of that mm -hmm. is it as gut punching as the impacts of for example 9-11 um, when when yeah when in, in different people were killed mm. and and uh, and 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 so those types of things i think it's so important for us to realize the 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 um let's say b uh, the contribution to the discourse of books like islamophobia like this book and then mm. of course the latest book the new crusades islamophobia and the global war on muslims and also realize that in many ways these um what is happening in the world also presents us as muslims with particular opportunities um would that be fair to say Oh, definitely. And I think that the, the way you framed it was really eloquent, I thought, right? So like what these books aim to do is to provide Muslims with a language to resist, right? To reclaim who we are, um, to, con to reconstruct our own sort of stories in ways that align with our lived experiences. And that's exactly what people like, you know, Edward Said did with Orientalism, what people like James Baldwin did with his work. Um, so I, and these are very much my intellectual heroes. And I, I tried to in my writing, I think about writing in a way that extends the legacies um, that they, you know, established and they rooted uh, in providing a subordinated people with the terminology, with the language, the reframed histories to think about themselves not as the other, right? So we don't have to compare ourselves to anybody as Muslims um, to, um, you know, identify what our story is. We don't have to, you know, complain or, you know, victimize ourselves right or justify our space or, in the world or justify our space in the world exactly we can just be in a way that is just being and i think um that is uh, you know a fundamental sort of uh driver of my writing mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 again, I, 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 you, you said it earlier on when you spoke about the fact that even as a scholar and somebody with years and years of experience within the academia, uh, and an expert in certain areas, how important it is for you when you unpack these terms to make us ordinary people understand, or to make us, let's say, those of us that are not in academic spaces, but understand uh, these terms so exactly. And and I mm. think that's the part I wanted to tease out, so so that we have the language. And we have these concepts and we have these definitions of resistance and understand that we don't need to measure ourselves up. As And, and, and when I say we, I don't necessarily mean Muslims. And that's why the Orientalism terms are so important to, mm. as part of humanity, mm. as part of humanity whose values and actions and beliefs should be underpinned by ideas, understandings around justice mm. for all, uh, equality, freedom, dignity. Mm. Those concepts, not sub, not in in subjective ways, framed through the liberal lens, but framed really through 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 the lens of of of, of humanity. And one realizes that a large part of the dangers of these uh, a, a, a sort of misconstrued or misunderstood terms is the very fact that within this dominant narrative, we constantly do believe that we have um, that we are free. Mm. And and that we have the freedoms that we do, and hence, and I, and I want to go go back to um to 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 the genocide, uh, hence the almost knee jerk responses that we have to the uh, to 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 what is playing out there. So automatically, no, 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 no. But as Muslims, we ought to or we see yeah. it in purely religious terms. Mm. What would be your your sort of comments on on that? Yeah, I see. I see in a range of ways. I, I see in religious terms. To me, the reli- the way in which I sort of frame Gaza as a Islamic sort of or a Muslim imperative is that I think that as Muslims we have a special responsibility to speak up. Right, because these are predominantly Muslim people in Gaza. Um, this is the Holy Land, and I think our deen, our religion, really obliges us to speak up for individuals who are aggrieved and persecuted. Right, um, so that's one dimension of it: is it being a spiritual Islamic issue. The other dimension of it is not a spiritual Islamic issue, but one that applies broadly to you, you know universal principles of. Uh, you know, humanity and humanitarian and, and, and human rights, right? So you don't have to be Palestinian, Arab, or Muslim to speak up for Palestinians, and you shouldn't have to be, mm. because the persecution and the genocide that these people are experiencing is, there's some distinctions, but, you know, I would like to think that if we were around during the Rwanda genocide, that we would be speaking about the genocide in Rwanda, that it, if, you know, I was younger then, but if, 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 um, what happened in Bosnia and Srebrenica were happening right now and was as accessible because of social media that we would be speaking up in the same ways, even though the victims there are white and Muslim. Um, I'm somebody who was very vocal on what's happening with Uyghur Muslims, even though that is in China. So there, there is a, um, and I'm going to be honest with you, there is a special sort of connection I have with Gaza as a consequence of who I am and because I have you know family who are from that part of the world. Um, but I'd, lo- I'd also like to think that we shouldn't just be committed to an issue because we have an ethnic or religious affinity with the victimized people. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things that's happened during these 250 days is we've seen a groundswell of um, support and solidarity with the people of Gaza from all corners of the world, right? We've seen it with, in my country, we've seen it with African Americans and Latino Americans and Christians and Jews. Jewish Voices for Peace, for instance, is an organization in the United States comprised of anti-Zionist Jews who have been in the front end. Uh, of fighting the genocide against Gaza. So um, as a member of the the global human community, everybody and anybody should speak up for Gaza as a consequence of what's happening there. But as Muslims specifically, I think, and now we're a couple of days away from Eid, right? And it's Jama'a today. And I think that there there is a special responsibility, I believe, for us to be on the front lines of fighting against genocide. Mm -hmm. So, so particularly two things I want to pick up uh, as as we yeah quickly run out of time um, would be particularly young people. You are yeah. in university spaces; that's where you find yourself all the time. And 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 you've seen yep. some of our you've met some of our students I yesterday have. when you were at the at, mm-hmm. at the University of the Western Cape. And uh, and and so particularly your comments on 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 younger people and again not just Muslims. Yeah. Even though a lot of this and a lot of the the movement that we've seen on the mm. ground, yes, in the U.S., uh, um, has been from from uh, there, there's no barriers in terms of you know these mm. human-made barriers, class, race, religion, etc. 
en masse uh, young people have been coming out to show the dissatisfaction mm. to use this language this language of 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 resistance um and and of course the genocide has uh, given rise to this mm-hmm. um and and so so what would be your thoughts around that and what would perhaps be but words that you would like to say to 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 younger people at our universities as well yeah no i've i've been really look i've been really heartened and inspired by young people their fearlessness their courage i think my students and you know young people across the united states and the world they they fundamentally understand that by taking a stance on this issue they're engaging in some degree of risk right they're risking future jobs or few they're risking internships they're risking being ostracized and blacklisted specifically in countries that are uh overtly zionist like the united states so the fact that young people are courageously standing up despite that risk demonstrates to me a level of courage that needs to be commended the second thing about young people that i'd like to note is this genocide is dramatically different than previous genocides because and i've written about this this is the first digital genocide in human history we're not only observing this genocide side as third party participants we're we're fully we're fully fledged engaged in this genocide right we're seeing images of people being killed in um, real time. seconds and minutes after they've taken place exactly in real time right uh we're seeing buildings and massages and bakeries and hospitals being destroyed and besieged as it's taking place right the the focal sort of like visible journalists on the ground in Gaza who are portraying and conveying what's taking place are young people. Mu'taz is only 25 years old. Bissan is only 22 years old, right? Uh Ahmed Kuta is only 25 years old. Um Mansur Shuman is in his mid 30s. So the people who have been our eyes and ears on the ground are young people. We're seeing this genocide through the eyes and voices of young people. So this is very much a movement that is being spearheaded by young people. So um and I think that's a wonderful thing and I we I want them to keep that energy up, you know, even though we're 8 months into this genocide because it's not going to end anytime soon, right? So the couple of things I'd like to say to young people and I say this to my students all the time is um movements like this are marathons and not sprints. If you're committed to this kind of work and I've been committed to this issue for um ever since I can remember speaking my first words right my father was a staunch my father was a literary he was an educate on edu- he was a not educated but he was al- always staunchly pro palestinian as a consequence of where he came from um is you can't get tired you can you can't get exhausted it's not a uh short race it's not a sprint it's a marathon the second thing i'd like to say to young people is um it's it's important to read it's important to research it's important to understand who the giants were before us you know like the Hassan Kanafanis and the Mahmoud Darwishes and the Sahar Khalifas the Edward Said um the Amil Habibis the people who have written about this issue and dedicated their lives and have produced so much knowledge um that knowledge should not be neglected So it's important for students to be activists but it's also important for students to be students and research um the knowledge that exists on these issues because that is very much going to nurture and advance and enhance their activism moving ahead. Yeah and I think what has been quite evident um I see this on your own social media as well um and I see this uh, with with younger people uh, to refer back to the language earlier on that it really puts out the this language of resistance um the types of slogans that you use that the way in which the genocide has been phrased and what's been happening and the way in which yes you're absolutely right one sees it played out in real time but also these the 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 way that when language is used in ways that it resonates with all of us yeah. so i cannot imagine living in a city like this that as you said earlier on that's that's bombarded to that extent that 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 is no food that there's no water that there's no mm. access to the most basic of of human rights but i can identify as a mother mm. i can identify as a sibling i can identify as a daughter yeah. and one sees this human language being interweaved with almost with with terms which have almost become um uh, 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 let's say d- disconnected from us in many ways or confined to yeah. academic spaces so one sees how these interweave uh, with one another and mm. and so for so so for me as as an observer then i think about the ways in which um this in so many ways yes has become such a unique opportunity also Yeah. for all of us uh, to, uh, to to utilize yes as 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 part of humanity and and particularly of uh, as people of faith so so in light of that uh, uh, Khalid um perhaps your 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 take on the the future of if there's such a thing the global muslim voice yeah 
Ooh, uh, the f- <laughs> I, I always like pause when people ask me to like forecast or okay, think no, about no where fo- things are no, going. No forecasting. <laughs> yeah. But- Look, I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful, right? I'm very hopeful because in my country, uh, I, I hate saying it like my country, the United States, because I, I have many issues with my country, obviously. But um, when I go to Muslim communities in, you know, across the United States and Canada, for instance, you're seeing a progression in those communities where it's shifting from immigrants working class entrepreneurs now to this new generation becoming lawyers scholars journalists physicians and you're seeing an upward mobility uh, in the muslim community to become more educated and more politically sort of conscious and oriented that makes me very optimistic uh let me share the story with you um so this happened to me a couple weeks ago i was walking out of the cafe uh, in my hometown and i'm walking to the car um and I, 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 dress, I, I, don't, I don't look like a professor on most days, right? I dress like in gym clothes and I just look like an ordinary guy. And I'm walking to my car and this middle-aged white woman follows me. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. She's going to yell at me about something. She probably recognized me from social media or something. She's going to call me an um, anti-Semite or something. I don't Obviously. know. So I'm, and I'm wearing a kafiyah, right? I have a kafiyah wrapped around my, ba- my bag. So she walks up to me and I'm like, do I engage her? Do I run away? Um, I'm typically afraid of, um, oh, how do I say this? And white women Karens, right? Because they, <laughs> they, they have a penchant for getting me in trouble. So something in my head told me to st- speak to her and I started talking to her and she's like, um, I just want to tell you that I really appreciate the work that you do and I follow you online. Um, and she asked me, where can I get one of those scarves that you have around your, uh, your, your bag? I'm like, you mean the kafiyah? And this woman looked like a... A Karen. A Karen. Yeah, like a middle-class soccer mom type woman, right? Like not somebody you'd envision uh, being in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, so we spoke for a bit. She talked about exactly about how, you know, she was really moved by crying mothers, losing their children, and how she related to what was happening in Palestine, not on grounds of ethnicity or race or religion. You know, she was a white Christian woman. Um, but being a mother... So it's important for us to understand that the affinities that people have to specific issues are unlimited, maybe, right? Some people might relate to an issue because um, they're a sibling, like you said, or um, they're connected to a place because they visited it. This woman was connected to Gaza because she was a mother. And the fact that she wanted a kafiyah, um was, was beautiful. And in many respects, to me, was kind of like a sea change moment. So I gave her my kafiyah. Lee, if you're listening, I you know she always Lee always tells me don't give people. I know, I heard that. <laughs> She's giving a part of your energy. So Lee, if you're listening, shout out to you. But I, I but I did give her my kafiyah because um, you know I want to pass on the struggle, if you will, to somebody who was a new ally in that moment. And I suppose for us as well. I mean, you're saying now about remaining hopeful. Um, and, uh, it, it was in that story one realizes how many stereotypes there are to debunk for yeah. ourselves as well yeah. you know you, you you saying what your expectations would be of of somebody when you see somebody you know sort mm. of superficially speaking myself as well i know this happens yeah and of course yes 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 that's a whole other story through years and years of being indoctrinated and and ways of being being imbibed and entrenched yeah. but yes certainly um and this, as this presents an opportunity for us yeah and it's to me it's like dawa Right. As like as a Muslim, I take that very, very seriously that we are all ambassadors of our faith. And one thing I'd say to young people who are inclined to cancel people and judge people right away based on the mistakes that they make or how they look um, is to try to discourage them from doing so, because you you never know, like you never know what Allah is going to present to you as being a potential ally. So for me, um, I, I'm far more open than I was um, five to seven years ago in speaking to almost anyone and everyone now. Looking forward to reading the next book, Khalid Bajor. Inshallah. Shukran so much for yeah. joining Thanks us so in much studio for today. Me. And all the best for the rest of your trip. For Shukran. those of you who don't know, I'll tell you in a little while where else you can see Khalid Bajor. Um, but yeah, shukran. Shukran. Thanks Jumma so much for having Mubarak. me. Jumma Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum.